Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word and reverence of God's Word? I'm only going to read four verses and I'm going to jump around 1 Chronicles chapter 12. This is not an expository message. This is a topical message. And I'm speaking on the topic of understanding what time it really is. Understanding what time it really is. Begin with me at the first verse of 1 Chronicles 12. Now these are they that came to David to Ziklag while he yet kept himself close because of Saul the son of Kish and they were among the mighty men helpers of the war. I want you to go to the 23rd verse. And these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed to the war and came to David to Hebron. You see there's a difference there. Ziklag, now Hebron. To turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. I want you to look at verse 32, and verse 32 is where we'll get the title and the theme of the message. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. And then one last verse, verse 38, all these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart, heart to Hebron to make, king, uh, make David king over all Israel, and all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask him to bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for all that we've experienced this week, for the missionaries, for the, our host here at Cleveland Baptist who have done such a wonderful job from the office staff to the assistant pastors and leadership here, Lord, and it's just been wonderful. But we've come to the climax, the pinnacle, the highlight of the whole week, and that's, Father, when we are challenged to commit financially to the work that you have called us to, to send your gospel, Lord Jesus, all over the world. Help us to be faithful to accomplish that task that's been delegated to this church not expecting for them to do something that some other church is expected to do, but what you have delegated to them. May we be been faithful, Lord, as we preach Friday night, that our faith needs to be increased. I pray, Lord, that you help us. We love you, Father. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. So that you'll understand just a little bit where we are in context, let me give you some background. Israel is now in transition. Uh, king Saul has failed God miserably. And as a result of that, the kingdom was taken from him. And God had chosen a young shepherd boy by the name of David, the son of Jesse, to become the next king of Israel. Now, there was a problem. He was anointed by Samuel, but there was already a reigning king. And so uh, David could not take the throne until Saul was taken out of the equation. If you know the story, King Saul had many times attempted to take David's life because he had an agenda. He had his son, Jonathan, that he wanted to become the next king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. Don't go there, please. Here's when Saul loses his kingship. It says there, when his rebellion against the command of the Lord, Samuel says to him, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. From that moment on, the kingdom was going to be taken from King Saul. David is his replacement chosen by God. You would find that in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill, down, fill thine oil, horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for me a king among his sons. Now, I don't have time to go over the whole story of how Samuel came to choose the youngest of Jesse's sons, but I will say this. David was a shepherd boy, and have you ever heard the song, when others see a shepherd boy, God may just see a king? There are those in our midst that we just don't think have the gifts and abilities to accomplish something for Christ. I have a sixth grade formal education. 
I'm kind of like Jethro of the Beverly Hillbillies, for those who can remember the Beverly Hillbillies. I'm a former carny Catholic gypsy. Doesn't look real good on the resume of a missionary. But I will quote the writings of the Apostle Paul where he says that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And Pastor Kevin Folger, I'll be the first to raise my hand. What you see here this morning is only God. I came to him as a young converted gypsy and said, God, all that I have, which isn't a whole much, a whole lot, I lay at your feet. Our theme song as a young Christian, was the song that Brother Jones sang here just the other night, Little is Much When God is in It. And so we see that David has been cho chosen to be the substitute. Now the truth of the matter, David is not the substitute because the Christ, our King, our Savior, is supposed to come from the Lion of Judah, not the Lion of Benjamin, of which the tribe that Saul was. So the truth of the matter, Saul was the substitute. Acts chapter 13, verse 21 and 22 says this, And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had been removed, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave this testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now you have to understand, and I don't have time to talk about the prominence and the influence that David and the tribe of Judah had on the Jewish people. The star of David upon the Israeli flag is David's star. So that's the influence on that nation. But this morning, I want to focus in, I'm going to make a transition here after we've talked about some background here. I want to focus in on verse 32. There were some mighty men that were given to David to help him. We see in Ziklag, he was in, he was in exile in Ziklag, hiding from Saul, living amongst the enemies of, the God, of God, the Philistines. We see him come to Hebron. And in Hebron, he's anointed king. Didn't, take the, uh, didn't come to Israel right away, but he was anointed king in Hebron. And he had some great mighty men. And verse 32 talks about the tribe of Issachar. And I want to focus in on the tribe of Issachar because of a phrase in verse 32. And of the children of Issachar, watch this phrase now, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Now, I would love to run down a list of all the children, uh, all the men that God gave to them. I'd love to talk to you about Zebulon. You'll find them in previous verses of how anointed these men were. Truly, the attributes and the characteristics that these, describe these men are really the attributes and the characteristics of the church of the living God. We should be and have these characteristics in our lives of children of the Most High God whose eyes have been opened by the grace and the mercy of a loving God who presented us the gospel by some means and we came to the Lord Jesus and had our sins forgiven and the Bible says our sins as far as the east is from the west put in the depths of the sea, blotted out with a thick cloud and my favorite thought about what God does with our sins is in the book of Hebrews, he says he remembers them no more. That's the all-knowing, the all-seeing, everywhere present God who chooses to forget our sins because of the finished work of his son, the Lord Jesus, and our faith that has been placed in him. Amen. These are great men, and I'd love to talk about all of them, but I want to focus in on the children of Issachar. Let me give you three characteristics before we get into the points of the message. Number one, they were enlightened people. Men that had understanding of the times. I am really concerned today, Pastor Kevin Folger is an itinerant preacher like me, he travels across the nation and the world. And my concern, and I don't know if he would echo this, but my concern is that most church members don't really understand what's really going on. There is a war raging, and the war is raging for the souls of men and women and boys and girls and that's why Satan wants to shut us up and is making us obsolete, making us dinosaurs, uh, people who dearly, the, the world thinks don't know what's going on. But the truth of the matter, of God, uh, of the, the truth of the matter is that we should be enlightened people. Amen. 
We should see the writings on the wall that Daniel saw that said, many, many, tickle your farsome. What does it mean? You have been weighed in the balances and come up wanting. God is going to judge those who reject his son, the Lord Jesus. And it is our responsibility through the preaching of the gospel domestically and abroad to get the gospel to them before they end up in judgment. So they were enlightened people. They were also educated people. Look at verse 2. Men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That means they had some knowledge. Knowledge that were able to lead others. I like this last thought of them. Look at the last phrase of verse 32. And all their brethren were at their commandment. They were enlisting men. They were able to create a following. Amen? Amen. I like to consider myself an enlister. You better hold on to your boys and girls. Uh, gypsies don't steal kids. They have too many of their own. But I am looking for future preachers and future preacher wives. And so if you're here today and want to bring little Johnny and Marianne up to the altar to present them to the Lord, we'll help you to do that. But the question is, what time is it really? If we were to take a consensus around the auditorium and everybody's watches, I think all of us would have a different time. How many remember Y2K? December 31st, 1999, the world was going to come to an end. Remember? I even got mailers from banks and insurance companies that they weren't responsible if something were to happen. If you don't know what that was all about, it, that there was only a, uh, there was a four digits on the computers then. And so when it got to, uh, to 2000, it didn't show 2000, it said 000. It was a four digit year. And so the computers were supposed to crash. Now, as a preacher of the gospel, you couldn't say it wasn't going to happen. Because if it did, you look like a fool. You couldn't get up and say, it's going to happen. Because if it didn't, you'd look like a fool. And so I took a neutral stand on the thing. But you know what? I had a philosophy. What year was it really? If you go by the Jewish, Jewish calendar, I think it was 5,600 and something. They, Pastor Pete, they weren't even at an end, an end of a millennium. And I trust the Jewish calendar much more than ours. Because ours could be off by four to five years. But if you really want to know why 2K was true, just watch Australia. They become midnight before anybody else. Our calendar, do you know that there's two Easter's? Because of two calendars. There's the Gregorian calendar, the Julian calendar, don't ask which one is ours. But Easter here was uh, April 9th. E uh, Easter in Romania was April 16th. There's two Christmases. Ours was December 25th, theirs was in January. Why? Because the differences of calendar. But what time is it that really counts? It is God's time that really counts. For Christ is the beginning of time. Revelations chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Psalm 31, 15, the psalmist writes and says, my times are in thy hand. The wise men of old, and that's who we're talking about here, knew what time it was, Esther Chapter 1, verse 13, then the king said to the wise men who knew the times. Even the early church knew what time it really was. Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica and he says, but of the times and of the seasons, watch now, of the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Paul is saying it's a given that the church knew what time it was. We are also to know the correct time. When Jesus rebukes the religious leaders of his day, he says, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Church, can you discern the times of the, the sign of the times? Can you tell really what time it is? Jesus said, I must work the works that uh, uh, I must work the works of him that sent me while as day, because the night cometh when no man can work. I'm going to give you three brief thoughts this morning. Number one, I'm going to talk to the church. I call you the saints because all my points start with the letter S. Saints or Christians need to calculate the passing of time. I'm talking to the church now. I'm talking to the born again believer. I won't have you go there, but Romans chapter 13. Verses 11, 12, as Paul writes to the church of Rome, and he says this, that knowing the time. Do you think Paul is assuming now that Rome, the church at Rome, knows what time it is? 
And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep, for our salvation is nearer than we believe. The night is far spent, the day it is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the work of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. It is time for the church to awaken out of her sleep and her slumber to understand what's really going on in this world, that will step up to the plate and do the job that is mandated to us, that has been delegated to us by our Heavenly Father, to take the gospel to the regions, the furthest regions of the world Amen. and on the street where we live and where we pump our gas and where we buy our groceries to make sure that all of our families are under the blood of the Lord Jesus because the trumpet's going to sound the eastern skies are going to break open Jesus is going to call the church away and there'll be no more gospel witness as far as the church is concerned Amen. you say oh you Baptist preachers, you've been preaching about the coming of Jesus for 2,000 years. Yeah, we have. But we're 2,000 years closer than the first sermon. Yeah. We need to be awake. Isn't that what Jesus said to James, John, and Peter in the garden? When they wouldn't stay up with him in his greatest time of agony, what did he say? He said, what, could you not watch with me one hour? The word watch means be on guard, be alert. It's a military term. And then he said to them, watch ye and pray. Be alert, be on guard. Watch ye and pray. Watch now. For the spirit is willing, but the, the, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Jesus knows that we have weak flesh, but I always tell him, don't look at my weak flesh, look at my willing spirit. Amen. Consider that Jesus is coming soon. He said, behold, I come quickly. He said in 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes and says, that Jesus said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord is coming as a thief in the night. Watch therefore, Matthew says in Matthew 24, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. Consider that the time of the rapture of the church is near. When Paul said in Romans 13, 11, for our, now is our salvation nearer than we believe, he's talking about the completion of our salvation. We're already saved, we're already under the blood, but we're not in heaven yet. And the rapture of the church, should we be alive when it comes, will, will be the fulfillment of our salvation. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen and Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Consider that the appearance of Antichrist is near. Consider how short our earthly existence really is. The psalmist writes and says in Psalm 89, remember how short my time is. Moses said three score years and ten. He says by reason of strength, four score years, and then it is soon cut off and we fly away. James says that life is a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanishes away. We need to make sure that we understand what time it is while we still have breath in our lungs to do the work that he's called us to do. The psalmist writes and says also, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Number one, saints need to calculate the passing of time. Number two, sinners need to consider their point in time. Now when I say sinners, we're all sinners. The Bible says all of sin and come short. Uh, there, there's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, Daniel says we've been weighed and the balances come up wanting. Isaiah says all oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We're all sinners, but there's two kinds of sinners. Saved sinners, those who've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus by no merit of their own, and lost sinners, that if they don't receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they'll end up in a terrible place called hell that was not designed for them to go to because the Bible says that hell was created, prepared for the devil and his angels. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Listen closely. For he hath said, said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in a day of salvation have I succored thee or helped thee. Now watch the phrase. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You say, preacher, when's now? 
The now is when you've heard a clear-cut presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? According to the writings of the apostle Paul, it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That Christ came to this planet, lived a perfect and holy life, born of a virgin. He performed miracles. He made the blind see. He made the deaf hear. He made the mute speak. Watch how he raised the dead to life. He rubbed elbows with sinners. He walked on cursed earth. He was arrested, went to a mock trial where he was beaten. Watch now. There was a crown of thorns put upon his sacred brow. The Roman cat of nine tails. It was a whip with nine strips of leather that had bone, glass, and metal that ripped the flesh from his back. Watch now. He was spit upon. His beard was pulled. Nails were put in his hands and his feet, and he was crucified on a Roman form of execution called the crucifixion. And hanging on that cross, he said seven things. I'm not going to tell you all seven, but each of them, the Bible says he cried. You know what it took for him to cry out seven things? You cannot speak without air. And some people would say, Brother Stevens, you got a lot of air. But one of the things he said, and in order to get that air, he had to push himself on his nail-pierced feet. He had to pull himself up on his nailed pierced hands. He had to throw back his head with the crown of thorns and pull in enough air to cry out seven things. And one of those seven things was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's talking about all those that were there, the two thieves on the cross, all those that crucified him, all those that mocked him. But watch now, he was taken off from the cross. He was put into a tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. Why was it a borrowed tomb? Because he wasn't going to need it very long. And on Easter morning, he wasn't there. And the angel said, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He's not risen. Come see where the Lord lay, past tense. That's the gospel. And you know what? If you're here today lost, this is your now. You just heard it. And I want you to listen to me, church. When it's there now, it's our now. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And I have succored thee. Jesus will help you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I have one amusement in my life. I like to go fishing. Uh, it's amusement. I don't have to think, right? And when you fish in Florida, it gets hot. And I miss Florida weather. And uh, sometimes it gets so hot, Pastor Pete, that when I'm done fishing, I go to 7-Eleven, and they used to have a sugar-free Slurpee. They don't have it anymore. And melon was my favorite flavor. And man, I get one of the big ones. I mean, I'm, I'm full of sweat, and, my, and I, I just guzzle it down. But listen closely. Every July 11th, from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., you can go to 7-Eleven and get a free Slurpee. Amen. I know where you all be July 11th. <laughs> and, uh, and boy, they get busy, Pastor Kevin. They get busy. I always get my free one. Sometimes I cheat and give one with sugar. And so now, now wait a minute. The illustration is about now. Don't go to 7-Eleven on July 10th. You will not get a free Slurpee. Don't go to 7-Eleven on July 12th. There'll be no free Slurpees. Don't go. If you go on July 11th, don't go before 11 a.m. You won't get a free Slurpee. Don't go after 7 p.m. You won't get a free Slurpee. Watch out. There is a window of time to get a free Slurpee at 7-Eleven. I know it's a poor illustration, but most human illustrations are poor. Watch now. God gives the lost sinner a window of time. It's called the now. And when the window's open, that's when you're supposed to get saved, sinner. Listen to me. This is your now. Amen. Right now. Amen. Not at 12 o'clock. You can get saved at 12 o'clock. But this is your now. Why? Because you just heard the gospel. Saints need to calculate their point in time. Sinners need to understand their passing of time, and then I need to finish here. Servants, listen to me, servants. Servants need to comprehend the priority of time. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. 
And he is the head of the body. The church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Amen. Talking about Jesus. Doesn't Matthew 6, say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Married at the age of 16 in the gypsy culture, took over my dad's traveling carnival business. Uh, uh, my, my, my late wife, a fortune teller, six months of the year, six months of the year on the carnival circuit. My goal was to be a millionaire by the time I was the age of 25. By the, excuse me, by the time I reached the age of 40. At the age of 25, I was on the way to satisfying that goal. But one day I got up so disenchanted, so disillusioned, so discouraged with life because I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing anymore. There was a vacancy. There was a void. There was a vacuum in my heart that I could not satisfy. It was like having an itch that you can't scratch. I try to satisfy that hole. I get up in the morning and go buy a new car. I'm not joking. Get a new wardrobe. Take another vacation. But I always awaken empty on the inside. Little did I know that that hole in my heart was God-shaped. And when someone told me, you need Jesus, I knew that was the answer because the vacancy was a silhouette of Christ. And on October 4th, 1980, in Loudonville, Ohio, during the Loudonville Street Fair, when I knelt beside my bed, looked toward the heavens, and I prayed, and I won't give you the whole prayer, I said, Jesus, save me, and he moved in. And my priorities of life changed because I was looking for all those things to be added unto me. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his rise, all these things shall be added to you. My priority was all these things. But watch now, it all turned the other way around for me. And Christ became the priority of my life. Amen. Let me say this for the sake of saying it. I wasn't always up here. I used to be out there too like you. And you know what? He didn't become the priority of my life when I got here. He became the priority of my life when I was out there. When uh, the king of England wanted to get the Penn family out of England because he owed the Penn family a lot of money because they supported one of his wars. So he satisfied two goals by sending them to America because he gave them a parcel of land that neighbors our state called... Boy, did you guys graduate high school? <laughs> called Pennsylvania. The designer and I have driven in Pittsburgh and I've driven in Philadelphia. Pittsburgh is a maze. It's like a spider web. It's so hard to get around. But not Philadelphia. And by the way, Philadelphia is known as the city of? Brotherly love. love. William Penn named it. He designed the streets of the city of Philadelphia, but William Penn was a devout Quaker. And as a devout Quaker, nothing could be first in his life. Nothing. So when he laid out the streets of Philadelphia, and by the way, they're numbered streets, he would not name First Street, First Street. You say, well, preacher, is there a second? Well, yeah, there's a second, third, fourth, fifth, and on and on and on. Very easy. They're all east and west, north and south streets. I think there's one large diagonal street all across the city. He said, what did he name First Street? He named it Front Street. Front, second, third, fourth. Why? Because nothing could be first in his life. Here's a tough question. If you don't like it, it's okay, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> What's first in your life? Amen. A man wouldn't name a street first. But yet how many things do we put before the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. You know what amazes me, Pastor Pete? How Advil, Tylenol, and aspirin don't work on Sunday. We'll make all kinds of excuses not to come to the house of the Lord. You know what? Maybe you need to check your heart. Hello. Is he first in your life? If he's number one. You say, well, preacher, I want to be number one. Listen, when Jesus is number one, you know what that makes me? Number two. And the old Hertz commercial says, when you're number two, you try harder. Hello. 
It's a good number two. Listen to what I'm asking you, church. Servants need to comprehend the priority time. It says time to seek that which is most important to God, to seek first the kingdom of God. Seeking his kingdom means that you are living for the next life and not this temporary one. Seeking his kingdom means that you're more concerned about the souls of those who will make it to heaven than anything else. Seeking his kingdom is meaning that the most important thing to you is seeing the face of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Seeking his righteousness means it is time to start living a righteous life for the kingdom of Christ's sake. Isn't that what Paul said when he said that knowing the, hard high, the time that now is high time? He said in the 12th verse, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. What's your priority? What's the most important thing in your life, servant? Is it Lord? And you say, well, I'm, I'm not on staff here at the church. Well, you know what? The old saying is, if you're not a missionary, maybe you better look inside. You might be the mission field. The Great Commission wasn't just given to me. It wasn't just given to these missionaries. It wasn't just given to your pastor. It was given to you, the church. He said, go ye. Who's he talking to? The church. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You're reaching Cuyahoga County, neighboring counties. That's what you're supposed to do. The lights are on here at home. But according to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we're supposed to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of earth, you do it through the faith, promise, commitment. Do you know that goers can't go unless they're senders? Help me. And senders can't send unless there's goers. And you have some goers here this week going to Canada, Zimbabwe, working in Milford, Ohio in the production of the Word of God. And it is our opportunity to send them. Heads are bowed.